Uh, good evening, all of you. Let me welcome you all on behalf of Asha and Ganga Jamni Heritage. Today is the World Heritage Day. In fact, the International Day for Monuments and Sites. India is home to 38 UNESCO World Heritage Sites out of the 1,121 such spots identified around the world. So far, only China, Italy, Spain, Germany, and France have more locations on the list than India. The day is dedicated to recognizing sites of historical importance, raising awareness regarding them, and stressing the need to restore and preserve them. The day thus promotes cultural importance while also highlighting the many impediments in doing so. The UNESCO website explains this year's theme as complex pasts, diverse futures. The history of a place can involve many points of view. The conservation of cultural heritage requires careful examination of the past and its practical demands provision for the future. In recent years, debates on certain narratives and particular stories over others have come to the forefront. Addressing difficult and often contested histories involves complex conversations with different stakeholders, avoiding biased views and interpretations of the past. Acknowledging global calls for greater inclusion and recognition of diversity, this day invites all of us to reflect on, interpret, and review existing narratives. However, today we have a different theme to discuss. Writings on the history of early modern Rajasthan, parochial or refreshing. And, and to talk on this topic, we have with us Dr. Mayank Kumar. Dr. Kumar completed, uh, is uh, Associate Professor of History at Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. Till very recent past, he was at JNU. His research interests pertain to exploration of human nature, uh, so human nature relationships right. in the early modern times. Dr. Kumar completed his MPhil by examining Hindi literature of 16th and 17th century India to point out the complex intricacies of caste system, a unique character of Indian societies. Later, he argued as his doctoral thesis at JNU that the ecology is defined and redefined by a mutual and continuous interface amid the complex webs of interactions among the physical, religious, socio-cultural, and politico-economic settings. Along with several articles published in reputed journals, Dr. Kumar has a monograph, Monsoon Ecologies, Irrigation, Agriculture, and settlement patterns in Rajasthan during the pre-colonial period, which was published in 2013 by Manohar. He has also co-edited two volumes on history of Rajasthan, the first being Revisiting the History of Medieval Rajasthan, Essays for Professor Dilbakh Singh, which was edited by him along with Suraj Bhan Bhadwaj, R.P. Bahugna. It was published in 2017. The second monograph, which he co-edited, was reconfiguring, uh, reconfiguring 
द हिस्टोरिकल लैंडस्केप ऑफ राजस्थान एसेज फॉर प्रोफेसर जी एस एल देवरा विच ई डिड अलॉन्ग विद सूरत भान भारद्वाज आर पी बहुगना एंड संगीता शर्मा हैज जस्ट बीन पब्लिश इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन He was associated with Decision Center for Desert City, Arizona State University, as Fulbright Fellow to work on climate change and water issues through an interdisciplinary approach. He was a fellow at Nehru Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi, to examine the issues associated with social stratification. and politics of natural resources management after that he availed ugc national research a fellowship to explore humans and natural world a study in social perceptions interactions and responses in the 17th and 18th century rajasthan he is visiting fa- faculty at department of environment uh, environmental studies delhi university and shiv nadar university at greater noida in uttar pradesh please welcome dr kumar over to you mayak shukriya nadim sahab uh, sabse pehle to main jo aapka personal loss aaj hai uske bare mein uh, hats off to you ki uske baad bhi aap aaj program host kar rahe hain मतलब आई मस्ट शेयर कि नदीम साहब के बड़े भाई का इंतकाल हुआ है सुबह और फिर भी उन्होंने अपने मतलब जो एकेडमिक कमिटमेंट है उससे नहीं चूक रहे हैं सर प्लीज़ अपना सबका ध्यान रखिए और इस बस क्या कहूँ अल्लाह आपको ताकत दे को बर्दाश्त करने की एंड लेट मी ऑल्सो एक्सटेंड द सेम आर्ग्यूमेंट की जो हालात आज दिल्ली और हिंदुस्तान में हैं Uh, this is not the best time to speak this is not the best time to discuss things uh, like this but since we have committed long before so i will continue and uh, uh, taking inspiration from nadim sahab ki nahi uh, apna jo academic or professional commitment hai usko hame nibhana chahiye uh, one more thing before i formally venture into my uh, theme uh, this is a general survey uh, my intention was to uh, discuss the, the the kind of historical writings are available for early modern rajasthan especially because the kind of documentation we have available for this region that is immense and that is possibly being explored extensively so as a as a general reader we need to go beyond what is being discussed in rajasthan in terms of only rajputs and rajputs and rajputs there is much more to uh, rajput uh, in mid early modern times the second thing which uh, i must share क्योंकि uh, गंगा जमुनी तहजीब की बात हो रही है तो मैं अपनी भाषा को दोनों के बीच में रखूंगा अंग्रेजी भी चलती रहेगी और हिंदी भी आती रहेगी एंड द लास्ट थिंग दिस टॉक इज डेफिनेटली नॉट फॉर द स्पेशलिस्ट वो पर्पज यहाँ पर नहीं है यहाँ मेरा लार्जर पर्पज ये था कि हम लोग डिस्कस uh, करें कि इन वॉट वे हिस्ट्री हैज डेवलप एंड वॉट वेज रिच इन रिचिंग आवर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ पास द कॉम्प्लेक्सिटीज द सिंपल नेरेटिव uh the binary is in which we are living today has to be challenged has to be revisited only then perhaps we will be able to understand the complexities of present times and the history of rajasthan gives us tremendous insights to the past and the way societies have been functioning so uh the, the specialists who have joined please excuse me if i uh, at times generalize things and at times i don't focus on the specificities one more thing uh i will be citing few scholars that does not mean there are not others who have worked on the theme uh just because of the paucity of time and because of focus of my own uh, uh, this presentation there will be scholars who might be missed out in my presentation so they must also excuse me i am not undermining their contribution i am simply uh, focusing on certain aspects of historical uh, history of early modern times and uh, will be examining those in terms of what is the necessity or in what ways we must visit our past uh please allow me to share my uh, screen uh, powerpoint so that i can uh, discuss the things with you and the names will become much more visible to you uh, next slide please the most important things uh shagufta i believe i can do that so let me try that if i can uh, share the next slide
right uh, uh my intention at the moment is to uh, first of all uh, argue that we are dealing with the pre printing press era and that is very important for us to realize working in a pre printing press era has its own complexities has its own uh, ways of understanding past uh, the most important thing which we must realize when we make a copy in a printing press era we make a uh, we can make multiple copies of a similar uh, script uh, sim sim similar manuscript but when we are working with the pre printing press era then the uh, the, the copies have to be made uh, once again by rewriting the whole uh, uh, manuscript in the process there are errors there are uh, mistakes and at times there are corrections so it becomes very difficult for us to understand what is the real intention because if there is a modification in the text in the second redemption or, or the second copy so as a historian we are working with those uh, changes also and in the absence of a very corroborative evidence we at times find it difficult to accept which is the correct one or what was the real intention of the author is it corrected in the supervision of the author or it is corrected by the or, or changed by the, the the copy maker so as a historian we work with those contradictions or with those limitations when we are dealing with the uh, uh, sources the, the other thing which is important for us to realize when we are dealing with the early modern rajasthan we have extensively been able to edit the books and publish it there are lot many books have been published especially by the rajasthan oriental research institute it has done extensively commendable job but the, the the editors who are working with the manuscripts the original manuscripts they have done tremendous job uh, narayan singh bharti hukum singh bharti and they have been very meticulous in their approach so we must give due credit to those who have laid the foundation for us to examine the rich extremely rich literary, uh, literary traditions i must also say that at, at present time uh, rajasthan oriental research institute is not getting enough grant and are 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 short of experts who can uh, help in editing the volumes and publishing it because once they are published uh, it becomes very easy for the scholars sitting across the globe to work on those scripts though there is a, a pro project is going on where the uh, the the manuscripts are being digitalized they are made available in digital form but once we have the edited volume a printed version it becomes easy for us to uh, read that and study that so we must give due credit to those editors who have worked uh, extensively and given us the a large corpus of published records along with those published records we have a very rich literary traditions which is yet to be published which is available in the manuscript forms so Uh, historians who are keen to work on other or or, or the, the the scholars who want to work on the literature or literary history of the uh, languages they get tremendous insight from the literary tradition which is available in rajasthan uh, one of the reason for the uh, preservation or conservation of these manuscripts is that the princely states uh, gave extensive patronage the rich uh, jain community the merchant communities gave extensive patronage so that these literary manuscripts or these literary works have survived over a period of time so those who are uh, interested in working on early modern times they uh, have uh, multiple kinds of sources literary traditions published and non published in forms of manuscripts then we have a very rich archival tradition uh princely states of rajasthan they have a very rich archival tradition where they have documented kept is uh, records of day to day revenue administration day to day uh, police administration various kind of bahis are maintained various kinds of uh, revenue records are maintained I, i will be discussing them along with that we also have a very strong painting tradition in rajasthan and uh, though i am not very uh, conversant with the painting traditions of rajasthan but i it need to be mentioned that there is a, a law, very long and very rich painting tradition in rajasthan i will be briefly touching upon that but i will not be able to share more details because i am not very comfortable with that apart from apart from these we have a very rich archaeological uh, evidences for this period from rajasthan there are public works there are palaces there are havelis and there are religious monuments all these provides us an 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 an, 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 an avenue or a, a place through which we can uh, weave a very complex understanding of historical past the simple one to one narratives uh, of a dynasty or a or a or a family tradition or a political history 
uh, uh, was uh, earlier practice, but now we are going much beyond that. And I will be uh, discussing the, the process of that. Uh, in the same uh, vein, let me uh, move further to uh, give you an example of we have a Khyat tradition. Khyat is from the Khyati. Khyati means glory or your glorious past. So Khyats are the historical traditions of Rajasthan which have been documented. Vat in a way is a uh, bath, the bath tradition. A particular incident is recorded. A particular event has been recorded. So we have extensive bath tradition available in Rajasthan and which are being used extensively by the recent uh, scholarship. Uh, then we have Vashnavalis of the uh, famous sons also. And these Vashnavalis are uh, available in, uh, in, in for the Jain tradition and for the Nathpanthis. And the, uh, the, the for example, the uh, Chattis Vashlomo Ki Varta, the Vashnavalis are available in those forms also. And there are very rich uh, Santhi tradition, Sant tradition in Rajasthan. And we have a uh, lot of peers and the history of those are also available through Vashnavalis. We also have Kave, the literary traditions, where various forms of carves are being worked. Uh, one of the carved traditions which I will be discussing is the Padmini, because that is most contested one, and we'll be examining that. Along with that, we must not ignore the Persian historical traditions. Though it is primarily Mughal-centric, but we have a very strong Persian historical traditions. At times, history is being written in the center, that is the Mughal uh, center, but they reflect on the history of Rajasthan. So the long historical tradition in that sense also, of, which is available in Persian. Uh, I must confess, most of the scholars who are working on early modern Rajasthan are not very comfortable with the Persian historical tradition. We have primarily focused on the uh, literature available in the vernacular, the documents available in the vernacular. But we are trying to uh, bridge that gap through edited volumes or through collaborative works so that the Persian historical tradition can also be uh, brought into the larger understanding of uh, early modern times of Rajasthan. Moving further, we have our administrative documentation, as I mentioned earlier. We have Marwar Pargana Revigat. This is something like uh, Abul Fazal's uh, Ayn, ayn -e Akbari. Uh, the kind of documentation of the whole Marwar Pargana is available in the Vigat is very, very helpful, especially the way I have worked or the kind of work I have done. The Vigat has been very, very important. It's a Pargana-wise, village-wise record of various things. The, what is the revenue? What is the nature of crop production? What are the uh, water amendment systems? How many wells are there? How many wells have become dry? What is the process through which they are being uh, reactivated? The, uh, the, the communities are living in those villages. What is the composition of those communities, which is the dominant community? So all this documentation has been done in the Vigat. So Vigat has been very important. This is late 17th century document for uh, basically Marwar region. Marwar is modern day Jodhpur area. We have Arsattas for Amir region, primarily for Amir region. Arsatta is from the Arsat. Arsat is 68, uh, means in Hindi it is 68, Arsat. And the, the uh, 68 kinds of documents or the information has been collected, which are available uh, Pargana wise for Amir region. Amir is modern day uh, Jaipur area. And uh, one of the documents which I have extensively used from the Arsatta is Hasil Farhui. Hasil Farhui is the kind of penalties which have been imposed. So we have the document through which various kind of penalties by examining those penalties or the crime, we are able to study the nature of crime which is being happening. In what ways those crimes have been negotiated by the state. So we have a, a very good source to understand uh, the nature of crime and uh, the punishment process at the village level. We have Wakil reports. Wakils were the uh, representative of the princely state at the Mughal Empire. And they were reporting constantly back to the Mughal, uh, Rajput rulers what is to be done, what is going on in the uh, Mughal Empire. So the way, the way I was arguing about the rich Persian tradition to understand the uh, Mughal, uh, Mughal Rajput tradition, similarly, Vakil reports are the other way around. The representative of the uh, ruler sitting in the Mughal Empire is reporting back to the ruler what is happening, what should he do, where should he proceed, where should he focus. So these kind of records uh, gives us uh, a two-way communication between the ruler and the, what is going at at the center of the Mughal Empire. We also have Arshdash. Arshdash is written by a uh, Pargana level official to the uh, ruler uh, at the, uh, the princely state. And the rulers is Arshdash, a request is being made. Various kinds of activities are reported. 
various kinds of directives are sought what to what should we do an example of that can be which i have been extensively using is that uh huzur is ilake ke andar barish bahut kam hui hai ab to moth hi ugani padegi which means now the this the uh, there is monsoon there is uh, rain but the rain is delayed so we cannot grow for the conventional crop we have to go for a crop which has a very short very short uh, gestation period like moth so these kind of documents help us the agrarian production system as well the way a uh, common man was negotiating with the uh, vulnerabilities of climate vulnerabilities of monsoon so in so those are those are the important documents to examine uh, the understanding of the village level agrarian production system and in what ways rulers at the uh, center were modifying their revenue policies or modifying their approach to extract revenue are uh, can be deciphered by examining these documents we also have dastur komvar these are the kind of uh, uh, rituals are described ki how to uh, uh, honor someone when somebody visits the ruler how to honor the the person so there are extensive kind of documentation not only revenue but the social documentation because when dastur komvar you examine then what is the status of the various communities what is the caste systems functioning in the at the village level or at the uh, estate level these kind of understanding of the complex understanding of society is also visible through the surkom war so unlike focus solely on economic history unlike focus solely on agrarian history or the revenue history we have documents from this region which gives us glimpse of the complexities of social structure and social functioning moving beyond these uh, documents from the amer region we have sanat parwana bahis for jodhpur region we have kagad bahis for the bikaner region and we have haqeeqat bahi for the uh, primarily for the jodhpur region these documents are very important for us to understand the complex functioning of the state itself i must uh, mention here uh, the way i was arguing that it is a pre printing press era we need to realize that though they are written with the devnagari in the devnagari script but there is a minor difference in language of marwar language of mewar language of amir language of kota bundi so which means historians it has to work on the very vari- variations of the script variation of the language even within a uh, prince, uh, province like rajasthan which we treat as a one uh, uh, administrative unit but those who are working with the primary documents they realize that the sanat parwana bahi are of a very different in, in written in a very different manner kagad bahis are complex i am not very comfortable with the reading kagad bahis uh, professor devla has worked extensively with the kagad bahis haqeeqat bahis are being used by uh, professor bahugna bahugna ji is using these haqeeqat bahis and other scholars have also used uh, these bahis so there is a there is a there is a it's not only focus solely on the revenue administration there is much beyond through these uh, documents which we can decipher in terms of painting let me briefly mention that we have udaipur tradition we have kishangar tradition we have kota bundi tradition and we also have amer collection uh, apart from the other uses to understand the, the the functioning of the state state patronage or the symbolism or the rituals which are vis- visible in the paintings we have baramasi paintings where we uh, various seasons are described along with that we have the duhas on, on, on along that when i conclude the last slide will give you a glimpse of what i'm trying to suggest that there are duha duhas or the couplets written on the painting which is primarily representative of the baramasi tradition apart from that uh, i mean i will not be going into the details but one can always refer to uh, the work of uh, dev bhanu singh chawla and his classic text uh, in the times uh, the end of our trail history of cheetah in india he has extensively used paintings available from the rajput region to uh, from the rajasthan region to examine the way uh, mughal empire and the princely states of that era were negotiating with the wildlife in what ways hunting war is taking place what was the negotiation with the uh, flora and fauna so painting have been used by environmental historians extensively i will not be further detail uh, discussing it because uh, i have not uh, worked on the paintings <coughs> let me briefly touch upon the public works we have uh, dams and embankments we have sarais meerta ki sarai badi mashhoor thi uh, while doing my research i used to stay at one of the sarai uh, in front of dargah ajmer 
uh, it used to offer us a very cheap accommodation. So I used to stay there when we were in our basic uh, research studies. We have Joholas, one of the method of water management system. We have step wells, and then we also have evidence of Shikarga. So there's rich archaeological evidence available for this period. Uh, Nadim Saab is hosting this uh, talk. Uh, Aligarh has taken extensive lead in uh, documentation of archaeological evidences. The Bhaika, uh, Ekar Alam Khan Sahab, uh, Ramin Kumar Sahab, Rajiv Sharma Ji, unfortunately, he is no more with us. Uh, Nadim Saab Khud, now Jibrail, all of them have worked extensively, extensively on the archaeological evidences available for the period. And then they have weaved it with the historical literary traditions and the revenue administration. In what ways they have been uh, used these dams and embankment, these sarais, how they were functioning and what was the social uh, implications of that have been extensively examined. So for this period, we have painting tradition, we have archaeological evidences, we have literary evidence, we have uh, administrative evidence. So we have a, 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 a gamut of evidences for us available. And then we started working on the historical traditions or examining these sources to offer a nuanced history of the early modern times. Uh, uh, I, I must also mention, though I mentioned it, uh, forgot it, uh, the, the temple traditions, especially the Rachor Nadwara, Nadwara temple of uh, Udaipur, the, the creation of whole Jaipur city is an, as an uh, research have been done on the, uh, the, the establishment of Jaipur city. Jodhpur, we have the twin city, Jodhpur and Mandor, Bikaner, the Lalgal, uh, the Lalgal palace. So there is a ample archaeological evidence which is to be explored. There are art historians who are working on the issues. I'm not, uh, I have not worked on that, so I will not be touching on this. But anybody who's interested on the archaeology or architecture, they have plenty of evidence available from Rajasthan to examine these uh, sources. Uh, before moving further to the modern historiography, let me uh, highlight one important uh, influence on the later traditions of history writing. That is uh, the demand of the colonial subjugation. And, and, and now I will be venturing into uh, something, something uh, controversial or debatable. But uh, the way uh, Mughals and Rajputs were colliding or they were helping each other or they were working in tandem with, uh, with each other, the same tradition is, was continued in the colonial subjugation. What I'm also trying to argue by uh, contrasting the colonial period with the Mughal period is that we need to make a distinction between the colonial power and the indigenous power. We, there are narrations where Mughal power has unfortunately turned as a, termed as a foreign power. We need to challenge that. No, it's not the foreign power. They were part and parcel of larger Indian historical tradition. Unlike the Britishers, who are colonial administrators and their orientation, their focus was something very different. The kind of exploitation which colonial rulers were doing was never seen in the Mughal Empire. I'm not saying the, uh, the, the empire or the administrative stru structure was not exploitative. It was exploitative. But they were living here and they were using uh, the, the, the resources uh, extracted from this region were used within India, unlike the colonial power. And the way colonial powers have subjugated us, uh, not only in terms of resource exploitation, but also our psyche and mentality, especially when we examine the overemphasis of Rajput tradition in Rajasthan in the contemporary times, we need to realize that the, the way Colonel James, uh, James Toad Wright wrote the history of Rajasthan and especially focusing on Rajputs has shaped a history writing tradition in Rajasthan. Uh, that tradition, which I'm uh, calling as a parochial, where they focus on the superiority of a one community, one caste, one, one particular group, without understanding that they constitute, the Rajputs constitutes only 15% of population of Rajasthan. There are other communities, and we tend to ignore their past, because it is the colonial legacy. The way J James Toad wrote, and the way ideologically they were using uh, uh, or they were, they, they, they were uh, cultivating relations with the Rajput uh, community so that their rule is strengthened, their rule is further uh, consolidated. So there's a long tradition of that lineage which needs to be challenged and fortunately modern historians have challenged that. In the same vein, let me uh, highlight 
uh, the, uh, James Stewart examined Puranas and on the basis of Puranas, he has created a long lineage for the Rajputs, which have been challenged by, extensively challenged by works like uh, Bidya Topadhyas and also by Nandini Sina Kapoor. But we must be very careful while using indigenous traditions like Bir Vinod and Jaisal Meri Khyat. Both these traditions are primarily following the, the way Britishers were writing history of their region. So Bir Vinod and Jaisal Meri Khyat, both are written in the second half of the 19th century, reflecting back on the history of the uh, Mewar or the history of Jaisal Meri. We need to realize that it is written during the colonial period and greatly influenced by the colonial historical tradition. In the same way, I am also referring on the Mardum Shumari. Mardum Shumari census, uh, which was done for the Marwar region in uh, Mardum Shumari Raj Marwar, uh, the second half of the 19th century. It's like a census which was done under the British administrative empire and the uh, Rajput rulers were borrowing it. So what I'm trying to suggest to you that the Rajput rulers for their survival, for their strength or for their uh, consolidation of their own rule against the, uh, the the sharing of power with the larger kin group, they initially depended on the Mughals, later on they depended on the colonial power. So we need to examine the complexities of historical documentations available with us for understanding of early modern times. Uh, the initial history writing traditions primarily focused on political history, as we all know, it was focused on the political history and the dynastic histories, the glorious past, as if there was no other community, as if there is no social history, and we, we, we should not blame them. That was the larger ethos of the historic, history writing traditions of that era. But, uh, and along with that, the local history of Velos. Uh, uh, perhaps it's, it was in response to the colonial domination where uh, India was shown that we do, you don't have any history, you don't have a glorious past. Perhaps to counter that, the, uh, even in the Rajput traditions, they were writing history where glorious past was, was being examined. The inner contradictions of societies, the complexities of the societies, the exploitative nature of societies was never discussed. Perhaps in response to the challenges which they were uh, facing from the colonial history writing traditions where India was being described as uh, 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 a very backward society, a static society with no change at the uh, local level. So perhaps these historians were trying to respond to that. But I must say that uh, we must understand that they were also under the influence of colonial history writing traditions where political history was the dominant mode of history writing. Now we move towards uh, uh, the, the, the modern historians, how they have moved beyond the uh, political history or the uh, history of the past in terms of glorious past or the glorification of the past. Major tradition came from the uh, agrarian history, primarily through the exploration of archival records, archival revenue records, archival administrative records. Historians like Nurul Hassan, Professor Sadish Chandra, uh, Professor S.P. Gupta, Dilbak Singh Sahab, my own supervisor, Dilbak Sahab, G.S.L. Devla, all of them have uh, extensively worked with the primary archival documents. It's not very easy work. It's just a very complex work, especially because you don't get a chronology of uh, records. You don't get a series of the uh, records. For certain pargana, you get record for a certain year. For other pargana, you get record for another year and then you have to weave history of uh, through that it's it was a painstaking work which they did sitting in the archives without any ac without any support of the modern amenities without the photocopy machine without the modern day cameras they were sitting together making copies of the document and then examining it it was a painstaking work which they did and they laid the foundation on which the later generation of the historians have worked very comfortably. So the way I was trying to suggest that uh, there were editors who have uh, given us the uh, published manuscripts or the published uh, works, edited works uh, from the Rajasthan Oriental Institute. Similarly, these agrarian historians were sitting in the uh, archives, working with each and every document, making notes of that, making sense of that, and then constructing a larger history of the, uh, of the revenue administration. What is important for us to understand that uh, the Mughal history 
was further enriched by understanding given provided by the history of uh, Rajasthan. Give me a second. What we had from the Mughal history, the, the larger uh, revenue administrative system, but how it was functioning, that was not visible to us. These writers made it, made it visible to us. I often use a term, uh, the nature is visibly invisible. The nature is visibly invisible. It's so pervasive, it's so visible that we tend to not write it about it. What they were doing, they were making nature visible. They were making the complexities of agriculture production visible to all of us. It was not easy. They were understanding the basic agrarian production system, the vulnerabilities of it, the complexities of it. Uh, let me highlight that a bit for you. Whenever we say that the revenue administration was decided by the Mughals that it's a 40 percent will be collected, what we tend to forget that because of the crop rotation, because of the intercrop when cropping of the uh, agrarian system, it was not always uniform availability of agrarian production made available to the uh, calculator or to the revenue administrator. Every year, the same field will change the nature of production. One year, if they go wheat, the other year they will be going the pulses. So the availability will change, and accordingly, the conversion based on the Ani Dasala has to be changed. So it's a very complex functioning. Not entire field of a villa of a, a peasant is cultivated throughout the year or regularly. They rotating the crops. They were rotating the fields. So these have to be documented from each season, and accordingly, revenue has to be calculated. So the complexities of that became visible by the historians working on the agrarian history of Rajasthan. The other dimension, which is very important for us to realize, that they were able to understand the caste system in what ways caste function in the revenue administration, how the caste considerations played important role in the revenue extraction. They were uh, they were riyati uh, peasant. Riyat means concession. Uh, because of your caste, certain concessions were given. Concessions were given on your land. But if you are cultivating on somebody else's land, despite you being from upper caste, you will not get the concession. So the nuances of that becomes visible by these historians. They were, were working on the uh, on, on almost on each and every uh, uh, crop and each and every field. Through that, we were able to get a very complex understanding of the agrarian history. It's not that the India is very good at the agriculture production. There were vulnerabilities. Let me uh, 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 give you one, uh, one more example of that in what way these complexities were visible. One village will get a good uh, rainfall and the neighboring village might not get the good rainfall. So the nature of production will change. The kind of concession or the kind of rebate which we have to, the state has to give to the person which has not received enough uh, rain at an appropriate time, that has to be calculated, that has to be calibrated and then the revenue demand has to be raised. Similarly, a uh, uh, mere measurement of land is not sufficient. At what moment of time, which crop has been grown, that, that is important for us to realize. Along with that, what kind of water is being provided? Is it rain fed? It's a, uh, it's, it's a natural rain or they are deploying extra effort by extracting water through uh, uh, Rahat or through the, uh, the the irrigation devices, if they are investing extra, so what is the implication of that on the agrarian taxation system? These complexities become visible when we examine the writings of scholars like Nurul Hassan, Satish Chandra Sahab, S. Gupta Sahab, Dilbagh Sahab, Jaisal Devra Sahab. Devra Sahab has worked on Bikaner region. Dilbagh Sahab has worked on uh, Eastern Rajasthan, like S. Gupta Sahab, but their period is different. Uh, and uh, the, the, the complexities of agrarian system and the social structure became further visible when we examine the uh, uh, works of a scholar like Surajban Bharadwaj, uh, Madhvi Bajekal, Shiv Kumar Bhanot, Narayan Singh Rao. Narayan Singh Rao has worked on Kota region. Surajban Bharadwaj has worked on the Alwar region. Madhvi Bajekal has worked for the Eastern Rajasthan. And all of them have closely examined these revenue documents and deciphered the character of agrarian production. 
it's not the revenue administration it is the agriculture production and its complexities which were being examined by these scholars so those later scholars who have worked on environmental history they get a lot of support by examining these published records or these public uh, works because uh, madhvi vajikal very closely examines in what ways intercropping was being practiced you saw two or more crops simultaneously with the anticipation that if there is a monsoon failure one crop may not survive but other the hardy crop will survive so these negotiations at the village level at the agricultural production level becomes visible when you examine these revenue records and try to decipher the functioning of the agrarian production system i am turning it agrarian history because we uh, tend to ignore, uh, relate it with the revenue administration yes revenue administration is part of that or rather revenue administration has given us insight to the functioning of the agricultural production system so scholars like this have examined the complexities of that we also need to examine or understand or appreciate that the the functioning of monsoon in amer region or jaipur region is different and the functioning of monsoon in jodhpur region is different the functioning of uh, monsoon or the rains in uh, in 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 the kota is different not because the rain uh, the the amount of rain they receive is different but also because the kind of landscape they have differs the kind of soil they have it differs the kind of geological formation they have it differs so the complexities of those region specific rain production become visible if we examine the uh, the works of scholars like dayan singh rao bhano saab madhvi bajekal or suryavan bhardwaj ji the other thing which is important for us to realize and i will be briefly mentioning that later on also we cannot ignore the presence or the importance of uh, uh, let me go We, 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 we should not ignore the importance of the pastoral communities and the trading activities in the sustenance of these princely states due to uh, the scholars like bl gupta uh, bl bhadani bhadani sahab is from uh, the same uh, aligarh school bhadani sahab has worked on the uh, the trade relations he has worked on the uh, the, the, uh, the the pastoral communities in what ways pastoral communities were very important for the sustenance of agrarian production it's a agro pastoral economy it's not purely agrarian economy so the complexities of agro pastoralism becomes visible if you give emphasis or if you understand the close relationship between the pastoral communities and the agrarian communities uh, let me give you an example of that i have used that in in, in one of my uh, in the book also in one of uh, article also uh, there's a dispute which is coming to the uh, ruler in uh, marwar region in the jodhpur region the complaint is that traditionally these pastoral group used to come and stay on my field this year they are staying on the neighbor's field they should be asked to come back and stay on my field because once they stay on my field with their uh, with their uh, cows and with their uh, goats my field gets the nourishment my field gets the uh, the fertilizer if we, if they stay on the somebody else's field they will get the uh, benefit so disputes like that becomes visible to us another example of that which is uh, is available from the uh, historical records is that traditionally i have been collecting cow dung from this village the cows who are roaming around in the streets of the village i have the right of collecting the cow dung this time he has collected it he should be banned from doing this because as a traditional tradition i have been using that what i am trying to tell you or argue at the moment is that please understand the 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 the, the importance on even on the cow dung in a forest uh, in an area where wood is not easily easily available in the marwar region or the uh, towards the greater and the little uh, thar desert the wood is not easily easily available so the cow dung becomes very important uh, component or important fuel for the household uh, sustenance so that is being contested so we cannot ignore we should not ignore the importance of the pastoral communities in the larger sustenance of the agrarian communities so these inter interrelations have been examined by scholars like bhadani saab bl gupta saab and the mamta she has worked on the uh, the, the functioning of the trading communities 
uh, she was a scholar of uh, Prasadil Baksing, has not published extensively. Uh, one of the articles is uh, carried by us in our uh, volume, in uh, which we have dedicated to Prasadil Baksing. Uh, uh, she's a scholar of uh, commerce, and Dil Singh asked her to work on the history of commerce in Rajasthan of this period. So there is a complex understanding of the economy, trade, pastoral communities, and agriculture, which have been used by these scholars to offer us a very nuanced history of the uh, of the uh, of the region for this period. Before moving further, let me examine. Uh, let me once again highlight the way. Archaeological evidences have been examined. I have already mentioned the work of Dr. Khan, uh, Raju Sharma ji, Ramin Kumar, Nadeem Saab, and the uh, What they have done, they have examined the uh, the agrarian, uh, the irrigation system. The Khalin system has been documented extensively by Nadeem Saab himself, and they, there was a whole team in uh, in Aligarh who used to go to the uh, field and examine the structure. Rajiv Sharma ji have examined the Karolpati Tanka of Amir and in what ways the rainwater was channelized in the uh, cistern and the large tanka at uh, Jagger Fort uh, up, uh, near, near Amir. Similarly, Rabin Kumar examined various uh, dams along with Iqtar Alam Khan. So the history of dam making is also visible to us. It's not the archaeology which is examined by them. What they have been examining, the state craft. In what ways state was investing or encouraging the irrigation system so that the revenue can be ensured, so that the continuous agriculture production can be ensured. So it's not the archaeology which is examined. That is why I'm saying that the complexities of the evidences available for this period have been very beautifully examined by scholars to give us the process through which statecraft is ensuring the construction of dams, through construction of dams, they were ensuring the irrigation of a larger part of the which is not irrigated. Satish Chandra Sahib has documented for 17th century Rajasthan that there is a gradual shift from single crop a year to double crop a year, which means the agri production is increasing. That increased agriculture production is reflected in the, the patronage which is being offered by the state to the literary arc, uh, work, to the painting work, which is available for this period from this region. So the enhancement in investment in the water irrigation devices, irrigation system further enhances the state's capacity to patronize, patronize the literary traditions as well as the painting traditions. There is a whole, a whole uh, uh, workshop in Amir region uh, for the painting uh, paintings of, uh, made available in that region. So the, the complexities of archaeological evidences with the state craft and with the literary tradition and with the painting tradition is to be examined. We cannot uh, solely focus on archaeology and the functioning of irrigation devices. There is a larger history of it. In what ways enhanced agriculture, product, agriculture production further changes the complexities of availability of surplus with the state and how that surplus is being used. So there is a larger complex history which we need to examine and which is being examined by the scholars like this. Uh, the other traditions, which is important when we examine the history of early modern times and the modern historians who have worked on, is the process of state formation. It's not that the the the, the, the dynasties were uh, were the divine rulers. The the way these dynasties were established, the complexities of that have been examined by scholars like Norman Ziegler, British Uttopadhyay, G D Sharma, Inayat Ali Zaidi Sahab, and R P Rana. Why I'm stressing them? is to make you or, or, or to argue that or to discuss that the, the lineage which is being claimed in the various traditions is not all that great. And the way state formation is taking place can be easily documented by examining the literature available for this period. Norman Ziegler has very uh, uh, closely examined the way uh, the, 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 the karma trade was exploited or was looted or was uh, the, the, the horses were <clears throat> captured by the uh, rulers and then they established their empire. In what ways from a petty uh, landlord they are emerging as a big empire or, or, or as, as a big state. The process through which they are uh, controlling or they are enhancing or they are expanding is be becomes visible if you examine the British of Adhyay. The whole 
a genealogy with which uh, James Todd has uh, uh, created for the uh, Rajputs was challenged by Bidhi Chattopadhyay. And he has very, very carefully argued that we need to go beyond the prescriptive literature, beyond the court chronicles to examine the lineage of these states and the complexities. And these scholars have also made it very important for us to realize that though now they are settled in their respective state like Jodhpur or Mewar or Amir, but they were not originally from that area. They have come from somewhere else. From a, uh, but rather they were migrants, and their migration is also being documented by them. Uh, I have not mentioned here, but somewhere later I will be mentioning that Nandini Sina Kapoor has also documented that. In what ways a state has emerged in these regions? So the complexities of state formation, without primarily focusing on the revenue administration, without primarily focusing on the uh, state, uh, the apparatus of a state, the process of state formation has been examined. Jiri Sharma. Uh, Zaidi Sahab and R. Pirana, they have examined in collaboration with the, uh, the Revenue Administration in what ways Revenue Administration has been used in the uh, state formation. Rather, I'll suggest that uh, what I'll, I need to highlight at the moment or stress at the moment is that uh, Ziegler, Bridget Rupadhyay and Nandi Sina Kapoor, they have examined, they have critically engaged with the genealogies available for these states. The later scholars, Judy Sharma, Inayat and Zaidi Sahab and R. Pirana, they have argued that from the kinship based structure from the uh, structure where they were living with each other uh, uh, sharing power with the their kin group now they are gradually converting them as a ruler and the relationship is changed from brotherhood to knocker and chakar means they are the ruler the dynasty is emerging as a ruler and the uh, the, uh, the feudal lords are emerging as a servant of the chakar so that that shift or the consolidation of power in a particular dynasty is very closely examined by Judy Sharma and Adel Zaidi and R. Pirana. So the complexities of state formation is not a state, it is not a static, it has evolved. That the process of evolution has been very closely examined by scholars. The other thing which we need to uh, realize that the modern scholars have not uh, have not confined themselves or have not uh, hesitated in challenging the formations of the earlier scholars. They have further refined it. They have highlighted that there is a fluidity. There is a change in the state formation process. There is a change in the state formation. And that needs to be examined. Which means, <clears throat> the, though one dynasty is ruling, but there are uh, changes in the state formation. There is a change in the administration. There is a changes in the, uh, the, the social composition, social relations between the ruler and the uh, uh, feudal laws. So the, that complexity is being examined in terms of state formation. Uh, moving further, because uh, I have only uh, suppose 15 minutes available with me, uh, the communities have been examined. When I say communities, uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that these documents gives us glimpses of the way communities were approaching the state. And by those evidences, we are in a process of being in a we are in a position to examine the interrelationship of the communities. Dilbak Singh in his uh, classic article regulating the domestic has very clearly examined, though these are archival documents, these are revenue administration, these are the document documents of uh, penalties. What Dilbak Singh has been able to very beautifully do is that the state's intervention at the at the family level, the social relations of a family are being governed by or are being managed by the state. In what way the state intervenes in the primary <coughs> functioning of the family is documented by Dilbak Singh. This challenges the, the entire narration of the colonial administration of the colonial power that the <coughs> state was sitting somewhere else and the local rural communities were self-dependent and self-sufficient. Documents from this region and the works like scholars of Dilbak, scholars like Dilbak Singh and Nanita Sai have said that, have argued that no, the state was actively participating in the functioning of that. Another article by Dilbak Singh is very important when he examines the role of Mahajans. What is important for me to highlight this moment of time is that the state imposed a restriction that if there is a, a famine continuously for three years, then the money lender will not be allowed to 
claim the interest and the capital which means the state was aware that unless the peasantry is here they will not get the agrarian production so the Im importance of various communities are examined in the, the, the in the same article dilbagh singh also examined the role of mahajan in the terms that a state used to state uh, state used to stand as a guarantee that if the crop fails and the money which is lended by the money lender is not recovered then the state stands at the surety the state will pay it back to the uh, money lender which means the importance of the peasantry and the importance of money lender both have been understood and the complexities are being examined on the basis of these documents moving further if we examine the work of nandita sahai unfortunately she left us very early she went very early uh, the politics of patronage the the, 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 the title of uh, her work is the uh, politics of patronage apart from the her work on the uh, on the gender studies uh, that uh, we'll discuss later on in the politics of patronage she has examined the artisanal communities in what ways artisanal communities and the state were negotiating their spaces how these communities were interacting with each other though the primary documents available for understanding of them is the revenue administration but by examining the contestations by examining the complaints by examining the disputes we have been able to examine when and where the state intervenes when and where the state says says that jo wajibi ho wo ki jo whatever has been the tradition do that which means we need to understand the power relations at times a state is forced to intervene at times a state chooses not to intervene and gives it back to the local local communities to negotiate among themselves by saying that jo wajibi ho wo kijiye which means we will not interfere in that so these complexities of social relations become visible they are not watertight compartments they overlap which over, over each other and that overlap is uh, is further uh, makes the study of this period uh, more complicated unlike contemporary understanding of past where very neat narratives are offered these scholars have argued that the neat narratives in terms of communities is not available communities were contesting with each other at times they were seeking help of the state at times they were negotiating it socially the panchayats were functioning it's not that they always panchayat was the sole arbitrator at times the state intervened so the complexities of the traditional understanding of societies is challenged by scholars like these dilbagh singh nanda sahib sujban bhardwaj sujban bhardwaj by examining the the history of meos meos of alwar region meos of uh, mewat region what he said that in what ways these migrant communities were gradually converted into peasant the peasantization of the meo community has been documented by surajwan bharadwaj what he is trying to argue that with the expansion of mughal empire and with the consolidation of rajput principality uh, principal principalities we find a process of greater peasantization greater peasantization where state is intervening in enhancing the agriculture production of that area <clears throat> we always we you generally we tend to blame the britishers for this but we need to realize that there is a long history of expansion of agriculture what nidadi bhattacharya has argued the great agrarian conquest during the british period we need to realize that the process had started much earlier the expansion of agriculture the way agriculture was being expanded and the marginal communities communities who were not agrarian were gradually converted into peasant and that peasantization has been uh, very clear, uh, uh, clearly and very beautifully documented by a scholar like sujwan bhardwaj i must also mention the work of tanja kotial uh, uh, i take privilege or i take uh, privilege in stating that sujwan bhardwaj ji tanja and myself we we three are a uh, student of professor dilbagh singh we have been groomed by dilbagh singh to examine these uh, processes of historical understanding tanja has examined the the nomadic communities in what ways the history of nomadic communities is very important for us to understand especially in an era especially in an area which is not agrary agriculturally very settled the area between marwar jaisalmer and sindh that bordering area how to understand the history of that tanja examines that in terms of nomadic narrative that is the title of her work nomadic narratives the nomads 
in what ways those nomads were very integral part of the larger agrarian society though they were on the margins but they were important component of the larger uh, agrarian society the way bharani sahab has argued for the pastoral communities here tanuja has argued with the nomadic communities who were carrying the trade who were transporter of salt who were transporters of various communities and they were also uh, 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 sorry, I have a spell wrongly. Kotia's spelling. It says K O T H I hona chahiye tha. K O Y lik diya hai. So uh, what she has examined is, is that the the, the, uh, the nomadic communities were also trying to imitate the larger agrarian pattern, yet they were maintaining their own independent structure also. In the series, last but not the least, Tripti Dev. She has she is being she is arguing the history of Charans. In what ways Charans are important communities? And what is the relationship of the Charans with the larger state formation? What is the role of Charans in history writing traditions? She is yet to publish her monograph, but she has uh, recently uh, submitted her uh, dissertation on the on the on the history of the Charan communities. That is an important contribution because through examination of Charans, we are uh, we will be in a position to examine the larger tradition of uh, history writing processes in this region. I have already discussed the economy and trade. Let me move to other important consideration of the state society and gender. These scholars like Sashi Devla, Kailash Rani, Priyanka Khanna, Geeta Tyagi, what they have been doing is examining another invisible part of the uh, larger Rajput history, the gender, the gender components. <clears throat> and what we need to realize that there are not only the, the, the queens and princes, there's a very complex history of gender. There's very complex history of gender for this period available to us. If I cite the work of Kailash Rani, uh, she is a student of uh, Sunita Zaidi Saab of uh, uh, Jamia Milia Islamia. Kailash Rani has argued and has examined the, uh, the, the, the tradition of uh, in the time of distress, the families used to leave their children, leave their women folk with the, uh, with the, with the wealthy sections of society who are staying back in the village. They left their son, they left their children, they, they left their daughters, they left their uh, wives with the la larger family. And in what ways later on they were being reclaimed. Which means the whole understanding that uh, uh, the, 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 there is a uh, caste distinction, though caste distinction is there, yet there is a local resilience, local system through which the larger population is retained. In the time of distress, the men, the uh, man, uh, the men folk is migrating, and the female folk is being uh, staying with the uh, wealthy sections of the society. Along with that, Shashi Devla and Kalashani both have examined the the, the 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 whole process of widow remarriage in the area. Traditionally, we tend to examine that the uh, Rajput societies don't practice the uh, the widow remarriage, but at the lower levels or the or the uh, or the. Uh, Non-Rajput communities, non-Brahmanic and non-Rajput communities, they extensively practice a widow remarriage. And there's a reason for that. The most important natural resources or the energy resource was humans. So there was a premium on the reproductive capacity of the females. So it was always contested. The documents very clearly tell us that there is a process of, there is a tradition of, there is a whole tradition of uh, bride price. The uh, during marriage, bride price was being offered to the uh, father uh, of the daughter. If she gets uh, widowed, so who will get that bride price when she is remarried? The the uh, father-in-law or the uh, father? So there are contestation on that. At times the contestation reached the estate. At times the 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 the, the victim or the lady herself is approaching the estate. So giving us evidence that even the uh, the females of the, the Rajput community or of the uh, Rajasthan area were had the opportunity or were, uh, they, they had the opportunity to reach to the state for the redressal of their grievances. So the complexities of the gender and the layered understanding of gender becomes visible when we examine the work uh, of scholars like Sashi Devla and Kalashrani. Priyanka Khanna and Gitanji Tyagi, they have worked on a different uh, uh, aspects of the gender. The concubines, Priyanka very clear, clearly examines the role of concubine, uh, the, the position and role of concubines. In what ways, where concubines were being placed in the larger 
code structure in the larger social structure. The famous concubine of Jodhpur region is the Gulab Bai. She, she was so powerful that she has constructed the whole tank in her name. So the, the, the complexities of the gender and its relationship with the state, its relationship with the, with the society are being examined solely on the basis of these documents available for this region. We have the uh, uh, personal letters which Priyanka has worked upon to examine the relationship or the, or the, the complex position of the concubine in the larger social setup. So there are scholars who are working on the nuances of gender and uh, fortunately the complexities of the social process of this period becomes visible in through the lens of the gender as well. Uh, the importance of religion has, has also not been ignored. The importance of rituals have also not been uh, ignored. In what ways we see a transition from uh, the larger Shaivya tradition to a Vaishnav tradition has been documented by scholars like Norbert Peabody, Monica Horseman, R.P. Bahugula, and later on, Mayurakshi is working on a, uh, something different. I'll uh, examine that. But let me briefly mention that <clears throat> the way these principalities were devising the means through which legitimize their rule, religion played a very important role. Rituals played a very important role. At times, they were imitating the Mughal Empire. Uh, the Mughal Emperor, the rituals Mughal Emperor used to practice. The same rituals are being followed or similar rituals are being followed at the uh, princely states as well. So the, the way religion or the larger scientific tradition uh, visible or present in, the, uh, in this whole area is being appropriated to further strengthen one's dynastic rule is also documented by scholars like Norbert Peabody, Monica Horseman, R.P. Bhaguna. What they are also trying to tell us that the segregation between the state and religion in terms of religion in terms of state uh, rules is visible but a state was gradually appropriating sanctity through religion to further strengthen their rule another important thing which becomes visible by uh, by, by the uh, works of these scholars is that a kind of larger Vaishnav tradition of ideal kingship is also being used to further justify or further legitimize one's own rule, which means in what ways the larger Vaishnav tradition has an imagination of ideal society is being borrowed by these principalities and they were trying to imitate that. But as I have been examining, I have, I have been discussing that there are examination of communities. So those communities were not dictated in terms of religious prescriptions or the religious rules. Rather, the complexities or the local traditions were given primacy. So there is a there is a multi-layered, multi-textured negotiation with the religion. Religion is being used to legitimize one's rule, but it is not being implemented at the community level. Communities are negotiating with the state on a very different platform. So that complexity we need to understand that it's not, it's definitely not theocracy. It's a different kind of negotiation with the religion. And uh, uh, the whole temple making activity is also important in that tradition. The scholars are working on that evidences of temple, religion, and the state formation are being examined to understand the complex relationship between state, religion, and rituals. Uh, the other important uh, work which is emerging for, for, from this period is the rereading the literature. We need to reread the literature. Why? Because the, when the literature is being created, it has its own historical context. So we cannot borrow literature simply on its face value. We need to re-examine the way literature is being used. The classical work by the classic work by Rama Srinivasan, The Many Lives of Rajput Queen, is very important in that sense. Renu Bhaguna has examined the, uh, uh, the, the portrayal of uh, Rana Pratap. In what ways Rana Pratap has been appropriated gradually later on. And now they have become a symbol of something what they never been. So we need to contextualize the literature. What is important for me at this moment to discuss with you all is that the literature is offers a very rich insight to the past. What is important for us to examine the literature in, in its historical context? We need to examine in the 
with uh, uh, exam or rather contrast it with the larger traditions of literature of that area of that era both only then will be give will be able to give a, a complex picture of the uh, society of that uh, society which is reflected in the literature uh, the padmavat as written by mahama jaisi is written somewhere else is written in the uttar pradesh and written in the avadi earlier we used to ignore because it's written in avadi so it's not part of the rajput tradition or the history of rajasthan but scholars like rama shrinivasan have argued that we need to map the larger cultural thought the larger literate the circulation of literature across north india and in, in what ways influences understanding or the uh, or the the, the the culture sensibilities of one region is reflected or is borrowed in other region so we need to go beyond the region of rajasthan to re examine the literature of rajasthan what scholars like these are doing they are arguing that the way uh, literature is being retrieved in bengal during the colonial period how the understanding of the bengali literature influences the understanding of the rana pratap as renu bhogna is trying to argue what is important for us to understand or what is important uh, importance of these works is that the modern day understanding of a particular uh, character or particular literature need not be the sole understanding of the character or the literature there are nuanced change, transitions there is a complexities through which the literature has transformed itself of a particular character so we need to examine those complexities in its historical context only then we will be in a position to locate it appropriately in its historical context so works like ramya shrinivasan is important in the sense also to challenge the stereotype which is being created for the communities or for the uh, princes of rajasthan we need to understand the 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 understanding of a later period is being imposed back for the uh, for this region <clears throat> similarly uh, the, the janet confrast uh, she has been trying to argue the literature available for the uh, medieval uh, marwar region or the maru 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 region and as a historians we need to negotiate with these literature examining its history, its literary uh, nuances examining the literary significance but at the same time keeping an eye on the historical context in which it is being written in what ways the larger gen tradition is influencing the composition or the composition of the uh, of the of the tradition is being imposed on that or in what ways the uh, the the sufi tradition is being imposed on the creation of a particular literary uh, text has to be examined so there has to be a multi layer reading of a text only then will be in a position to uh, to examine the significance of the literature so there is a need to reread the literature in its historical context which has been done extensively and very beautifully by the scholars like ramesh shrinivasan renu bhogna and janet contrast last uh, but not the least uh, this is the area where, where i have worked uh, the beginning of the environmental history for rajasthan can be definitely seen in the works like gs uh, of devla who was trying to examine the expansion of uh desert in this area or the expansion of desertification he has extensively examined the the, the lakhi jungle which is near bhatinda region in what ways lakhi jungle is gradually disappearing because of the uh gradual disappearance of the uh, the rivers which were feeding it or the the ghagra hakkar hakka tradition which was a uh, 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 ghagra hakra uh, river tradition which was feeding into the uh lakhi jungle is gradually being uh disseminated or gradually being uh depleted leads to the uh, uh elimination of lakhi jungle what is also important for us to realize that uh, till the times mughals uh, came the primary entry point to largest subcontinent of india was through indian desert the punjab was not extensively used most of the movements in pre mughal period was from the sindh and from the uh, rajput uh, from the rajasthan region so there was a reason for that in what and the lakhi jungle played very important role in that transition and the larger karma which was passing from this area also facilitated the movement of the military so there is a large larger understanding of environment which has to be weaved in if we want to examine the uh, rajasthan beyond rajasthan 
what Giselle Devra has also examined is that we need to go beyond the modern modern confines of Rajasthan. We need to go to the uh, Sindh region. We need to go to the uh, Multan region. Only then we will be in a position to reflect back on the history of Rajasthan. The larger environment cannot be segregated in terms of modern day political boundaries of Rajasthan. We need to examine in the context of larger uh, landscape extending up to the uh, Afghanistan. And he has extensively documented that. He has also been try trying to understand in what way salt making tradition has been important if you want to understand the Chauhan dynasty. The Chauhan, he is arguing, are basically shucks and there's a larger tradition of salt making visible in the Chauhan, extending from uh, Sambar region up to the, uh, uh, the, the, the run of Kutch. There's a whole uh, set of uh, Chauhan communities who are basically into salt making. Shaks are also in the salt making. So the larger history of the movement of the communities across in the subcontinent way beyond the subcontinent has to be understood only then the larger environmental history can be reconstructed i will not comment on my own work which is uh, primarily on the monsoon ecologies understanding the centrality of monsoon if we want to examine the history of rajasthan or rather the history of indian subcontinent so we need to examine the functioning of monsoon uh, let me almost conclude by uh, highlighting the work of abhimanyu har arha he is at the moment teaching at jaipur university he, has, uh, he was trying to argue the importance of fodder. In what ways fodder was very important to for the sustenance of the empire. So it's not only agrarian production, rather the production of fodder was, was very important. Uh, I have uh, not uh, dealt this with earlier, but let me highlight or let me stress that when we examine the environmental history, we need not focus solely on history of forest and history of agriculture. There is a large part which is the uh, the grassland. So history of agriculture, history of grassland, history of wetlands, and then the history of forests. It's a combination of these. Only then will we give a, will we be in a position to examine the larger structural tradition. We tend to ignore the importance of the grassland. We tend to examine uh, ignore the importance of the wetlands. So scholars like Abhimanyu Ara, Devra Saab, and uh, I have been trying to examine or integrate the significance of wetland, grassland, forest, and the green landscape to offer a, a comprehensive understanding of environmental history. We have not extended our work into the uh, fauna, except Abhimanyu, who has worked on the on, on the cavalry. Uh, uh, Divbhanu Singh Chawla, whom I mentioned earlier, has worked on the history of cheetah, and he has used uh, painting as well as other uh, evidences available from Rajasthan region. Paintings, I'll simply share uh, a couple of paintings to under, to make you realize the rich tradition of painting available from this region. This is painting shared by Nilanjan, one of my friends, uh, Karsi Nilanjan. This is Raja Balban Singh watching the rain clouds from the roof of his palace, painted by, painted by Nan, Nansuk of Guler, 1751. These are important sources for us to examine the nature and the environmental history and the statecraft and the complexities or interconnections of these systems to, me, to give us a a complex and very uh, rich understanding of early modern times. Thank you very much. This is the painting I was talking about, the Baramasa, where you have couplet at the top and the, uh, the depiction of the nature. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mayan, uh, for a very very brilliant, uh, uh, you know, this was, uh, explanation of the history of Rajasthan. Uh, you spread a very wide net uh, to encompass, encompass the entire gamut of the Rajasthan studies. This is what you are asking for me. Incorporating, you know, myriads of palettes with myriads of flavors of writings which have been done on Rajasthan. And I uh, hope that everyone who has heard this lecture or is going to hear this lecture on the YouTube uh, would have, you know, uh, an entire gamut of knowledge what to look for if he has to study the history of Rajasthan. 
uh, you started uh, with uh, the primary source material, the type of sources, and then uh, you made a thematic study of the secondary works. What are the various various areas on which work has been done? along with the name of a large number of scholars who have actually contributed. Uh, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning of your uh, talk, that in a lecture like this, it is almost next to impossible to, uh, uh, you know, uh, name each and every one of, uh, who has worked on the piece. That is next to impossible. But the way you explained, I think you have included even those who have contributed uh, not much to the field, but have made weak attempts to enter into the field of Rajasthan. I mean, people like myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, by no stretch of imagination, uh, I ever thought that my name would be occurring in the name of people who are working on that. Uh, yes, but yes, have, an important contribution. Yes, I have uh, made, but that means that your study was very, very thorough. Uh, well, uh, I have uh, one or two questions of mine, uh, but before I uh, put them up, I would request that a few questions which have been asked by the audience, first they may be taken up and then I will put up my uh, very weak questions on the topic. I'll try uh, my best to respond, sir. Uh, well, Masoom Dilla asks, who uh, created a unified province of Rajasthan? Akbar is generally the answer, whether it is correct or whether, whether it is wrong. Uh, uh, Mohsam Sahib, this is what we are trying to challenge. These modern day understanding of Rajasthan or relationship between uh, Mughals and Rajas, Rajputana has to be uh, challenged. Uh, Rajasthan is a very modern born and nomenclature. So equating Rajasthan with the uh, Rajputana of Mughal period is a problematic pro uh, proposition. Uh, what is why it is important for us to challenge is that the work like Sunita Zaidi, who has worked on Sindh, and the Rajputs who are available or who are present in the other parts of India, like the, the, especially the work of uh, the uh, cloth. So what is the name of the just a second, give me a second. Uh, a scholar like uh, Nokar Sipahi and uh, give me Kolf. a second. Call. Call. Yeah, Kolf. Terry Call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a scholar Kolf. like them, a scholars like them have made us realize that the Rajputs are not solely confined in Rajasthan area. So equating Rajasthan and Rajput needs to be problematized and needs to be challenged. So uh, I'll not say that Akbar gave it a modern nomenclature. What I'm, we are trying to suggest is that these princely states, initially with the Mughals, later on within the, during the patronage of the Britishers, were able to offer us a rich historical literature through which we have been able to examine the early modern times. This kind of archival document or primary document is not available for any other part of the uh, of Indian subcontinent. Uh, confining them or reducing them only as a Rajput or Rajasthan will be a problematic because the boundaries keep on changing. Uh, there is a complex understanding of the Vatan Jagir, uh, the area which the, which was given to the Jam Amer, which is given to the Jodhpur, which is given to the Mewar, gradually or regularly shifted at the will of the Mughal Empire. Uh, the, the Khalsa land can be extended. Ajmer can take a part of the Mewal, Ajmer can take a part of the Sambhar. So in what ways we are going to define Rajputana, Rajasthan, as well as the Mughal princely state, or the Mughal state and the princely states. The same problem extends when we examine the, the princely state, British Empire, 
when we got independence, there was a British India and then there was a princely state. Confining them to a one nomenclature will be a, will be a problematic proposition. And I'll, I'll not uh, subscribe to this view. Unfortunately, I will not subscribe to this view. Uh, well, I would like to add to what uh, Mayank uh, uh, you know, replied. I would just point out to Masum Billah that, uh, uh, you know, look at the term Rajaputra, from which uh, the, the name of the territory Rajputana ultimately came to exist. The term Rajaputra itself is a creation of around 8 to 10th or 11th centuries. Yeah. You know, that was the time when this uh, you know, class of people started emerging. Hmm. Uh, uh, ultimately, they started concretizing as, uh, you know, armed retainers, uh, the Rajaputras, the sons of the uh, small principalities of kings, the uh, period when uh, the so-called Indian feudalism was establishing itself in the Indian subcontinent. Later on, it was during the uh, 16th century, almost at a time when the Lodi Empire uh, was in doldrums and Babar was knocking at the doors of the country, that another thing happened and that was these small uh, Rajaputra, uh, you know, principalities or smaller areas now started, uh, you know, coming together and forming large zamidaris. Mm -hmm. So much so that, that by the time that uh, Akbar's empire was established, we find uh, Akbar's source, uh, period sources like Arif Kandari and others yeah. speaking about the Rajput zamidars, 500 or so of them. And, uh, you know, uh, Arif Kandari and others talked about that if Akbar started fighting them, it would take around 200 or 300 years for the, him to, you know, uh, conquer all of them. And so the better policy would be that we should uh, now have some sort of a policy uh, to enter into some sort of a relationship. Uh, so definitely one thing is clear. I mean, I'm no expert of this field, but as per my understanding, the territory of Rajputana, what we now call as Rajputana, the term possibly started being used during the colonial period. Uh, okay. My uncle, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. That, that uh, uh, you know, uh, whole uh, concept of the territory started developing during the 15th, 16th centuries. Humayu, when he was uh, facing now, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Afghans from the region of Bihar or the onslaught of the Gujarati ruler from the side of Malwa had also to contend with these so-called Rajput states who were, you know, uh, uh, siding with the Gujarat ruler and also yeah. making moves against Kumai. So possibly even before Akbar comes to the scene, there is some territory which such type of people getting established there. And by Akbar's time, this whole territory started, you know, emerging as a powerful, you know, states or divisions having military prowess. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, I have been able to explain what my understanding of the term is, but this is, I think, what I would answer to you. No, Rajputana has not been created by Akbar. It was a process which was independent of Akbar. But yes, the uh, relation, political, you know, uh, relationship, the coming of powers together of these chieftains with the Mughal emperors and their, you know, coming into marriage alliances did help in their further development. And by British times, we have a powerful Rajputana state, yes. uh, which is there. I mean, this is what I would say. Next question is Lakshmi Kant Mishra. Interesting. Can you provide the trajectory of ir uh, irrigational history and peasants 
as discussed by B. D. Chattopadhyay to that of situation during the 18th century. Rashmi Kanji, very interesting uh, question, but it cannot be responded as a question as a session. Uh, let me share one of my article. The details. Uh, it was published in Medieval History Journal. It's a part of my book as well. Uh, what is important for us to realize that uh, the history has changed. The education history has changed. British Ropadhyay has worked on the. Uh, what he has suggested is that the eight ninth century we have evidence of Nadi Matrak to Dev Matrak transition from Nadi Matrak to Dev Matrak. And uh, while later on working on the same tradition and borrowing the works from the uh, Nadim Sahab of the Khalin uh, is a small embankment uh, in Jaisalmer region. What we have been able to argue, rather I have been argued, is that with the uh, greater aridity increasing in that area, we see penetration of agriculture in the interiors of desert area. That is Jaisalmer area. Jaisalmer is settled. And the evidence comes from the study of uh, B.D. Chiropadhyay, who says that now we are shifting from river fed irrigation to rain fed irrigation. And the whole man method of rainwater harvesting, which is manifested in Khalin, is now uh, becomes the dominant way of irrigation. So we are moving from river fed irrigation to monsoon fed irrigation or rain fed irrigation, which is by the 18th century is the most dominant one. Uh, Jib Jibrail has worked on that. Uh, if you read the uh, Munton and see the Vigat, then you get the evidence of various kinds of rainfed irrigation. Behlos are there. There are small uh, minti uh, rela is there, which means the rainwater has come, which has spread over a long, uh, long uh, land, which becomes fertile. And there's a complex community history also. The Paliwal Brahmans, who are primarily from Pali, Pali that is on the other side of the Aravalis, which must have witnessed the overflow of the rains. How they go to the Jaisalmer region and use the same technology which is available for the Pali region, for Jaisalmer region, and make uh, Jaisalmer a very rich agricultural center for wheat production. So, there's a very large complex history of transition from early period to 18th century. It's available in my work, it is available in the article published by the Medieval History Journal. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, Mayan, for this answer. I mean, in fact, uh, during the course of my own surveys in the Jaisalmer region. Uh, in fact, when I was working on the uh, Paliwal settlements uh, of uh, Jaisalmer region, uh, I was able to uh, locate around uh, 27 khedas uh, of the Chaurasi khedas which are mentioned uh, in the local sources. For example, uh, there is Tawari Khe Jaisalmer, which talks about Chaurasi Khedas. And even if today you go to Jaisalmer or Pokhran region, Sathalmer, as it is known in the sources, you would be hearing about uh, the Chaurasi Khedas of Pallivals. Yes. Uh, uh, I have been able to trace only uh, 27 or so which are mentioned uh, uh, in Tawari Khe Jaisalmer, which is a 19th century work. The 18th, 19th century work uh, completed during the 19th century uh, by one of the divans of the Jaisalmer state. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have also tried to look at the uh, surviving villages out there. And naturally, now not all those 27 mentioned in uh, Tawari Khad Jaisalmer survive, only 16, 17 or so physical remains of them survive. Uh, and along with them, uh, at least four or five khadims are also, uh, uh, you know, in a working condition in present day yeah. Jaisalmer uh, district. For example, the uh, khadim near Khaba is very large, and you would find it that. But the area has been converted into a green land by the technology which these Pallivals brought to this region. That is uh, uh, something to be seen. I'm sorry, I digressed from uh, that, but I just wanted to inform you that uh, the, 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 the technology which was used by the Pallivals uh, is still extant and you can still yeah. see the, uh, the, the those big talaos which have been created 
with large number of orchards, fields, gardens, which still survive out there. Uh, any other question? Uh, just a second. Uh, Lakshmi Khan Ji, I have two books that I have shared. I can't forget to read the education system if you have to read the education system. Rajasthan Ki Rajat Kundin. And the Center for Science and Environment has given a good collection of Dying Wisdom. Citizens Report, Volume 5. I have given the details in the chat box. You can uh, copy it and use it. These are very extensive documentation of irrigation system of across India in Dying Wisdom and for Rajasthan in the Anupam Mishra's uh, Rajasthan Ki Rajat Kundin. Uh, Lashmi Kanji also asked, how did the nomads contri contribute to agrarian expansion? Lashmi Kanji, very important question. Very, very important question. Unfortunately, the times we are living in has become agrarian. We don't realize that uh, uh, prior to industrial revolution, the primary source of energy was either humans or animals. The most intelligent form of energy resource was humans. That is why we have caste system. That is why we had the slavery. That is why we had the feudal mode of production. All these were mechanisms of controlling the human uh, human energy. This is uh, important for agrarian production, for the state making, for the empire making. This is a very rich literature available on the history of the animals. The way camels were being used, the horses were being used, elephants were being used. Uh, Richard Bulliard's classic book, The uh, Camel and the Wheat. All these make you realize that the animals very important were very important component of human settlement. What we tend to ignore is that prior to the industrial revolution, Horses was the most fast, the most important source of communication and transportation. We cannot ignore the importance of banjaras for the transportation of goods. In my own childhood, Nadim Shah will appreciate that in our childhood, banjaras used to bring the salt to the our villages or to the our mohallas. So the nomadic communities had a very important role to play in the larger agrarian setup. The exchange of goods, the exchange of uh, various kinds of agri produ agriculture production was carried through these nomadic communities. The other thing which we need to realize is that the sedentary life is a later consideration or later development. The primary human uh, tendency has been to nomadic, to move around. This, that is what I was trying to uh, argue in the beginning. The, the modern day identification of Sisodias with Udaipur, uh, Rathors with the uh, Jodhpur, and the uh, Kachwas with the Amir is problematic. All of them, them have come from somewhere else. They were migrating. So the movement was a very important consideration of the past. We tend to ignore and we tend to focus primarily on the agrarian settlements and we presume that they have been here since time immemorial. No. Nomadic or the migrant migrations has been the dominant form of human sustenance. Uh, Lakshmi Kanji, uh, you know, uh, my knowledge about uh, uh, Rajasthan is very limited because I have uh, confined my studies only to uh, one part of it, that is Jaisalmer region, where I studied uh, the uh, Palliwal villages, especially one of the village, Kuldhara. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, my uh, reading uh, suggests that uh, even if you look at the Pali Vals, you would pro probably be able to uh, understand what was the contribution of the so-called nomadic tribes. And Pali Vals also, just like the nomads, they were not nomads by no stretch of imagination. But they were migrants from the Pali region. They came and settled uh, in uh, Barmer, uh, uh, Pokhran, uh, Jaisalmer, and they started establishing, uh, you know, a number of villages here and there. Uh, they, these settlements or uh, villages would remain uh, till water was available to them and then they would migrate somewhere else. But if you look at the Vigat, you look at the Khayat, you look at the agrarian documents uh, which survive from that region, you would come to understand that using their techniques, their knowledge, which they had brought from Pali region to this region, uh, their villages became the areas where there was, uh, you know, two uh, fasle I mean, two crops were both, uh, you know, uh, the crops of both the seasons, and one of most of the revenues were being 
uh, uh, collected from these areas. And then the products of these areas, uh, uh, they would then transport via Baluchistan and Multan uh, uh, towards the Northwest and also towards the other areas. So in a way, this, uh, you know, uh, mobile population uh, act at least in the uh, area of Jaisalmer contributed uh, so much uh, to the de economic development that they came to be known as the Mithayas of the desert. In fact, uh, there were claims that under during the period of Akbar, they were one of the richest communities of that area. So much so that, that they had large number of gold coins which they had collected. This is not only a legend. Uh, you know, uh, in modern times, in fact, uh, during one of my visits, when I was at uh, this Pali village known as Kuldara, the moment uh, we left the village, after half an hour or so, an American team with metal detectors, they reached the village, uh, removed the few stones and found, you know, a hidden wealth of Akbari coins. Gold okay. and silver. Hmm. They were caught. That's another matter. But you know that gave credence to all those stories which were being circulated during the 19th century or written by uh, Tawari Khe Jaisalmer or are being sung by the Langaniya and Manganiya communities in the Jaisalmer yeah. region. If you go there, they are singing songs in praise of these Pallivals that they say that they had hoons and gold and silver, uh, which they would, uh, you know, distribute to people. That got authenticated by a number of such discoveries from a small village known as Kundar. So in a way, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, these uh, people who were migrating from one place to another, uh, uh, they were actually not nomadic class. They were not Banjaras. They came and settled here for a few centuries. But still, uh, they were still mobile. Uh, uh, they, 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 they carried on trade up till Baluchistan and beyond. And they would go there and then return back. Uh, and they did uh, contribute a lot so that many legends uh, were circulated about them. So if this is the case of a particular one village, one can imagine the situation all over uh, the region of Rajasthan. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Mayank, let me once again thank you for... Uh, Narendra, one second. Really, yeah. So, uh, Mughal Empire, we also told them that Mughal Empire was so mobile and how much it was used. Uh, uh, Lakshmi Khan Ji, actually, uh, even the Mughal Empire was a peripatetic empire. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, even their cities, their you know, beautiful city like Faipur Sikri, is nothing but a camp city transformed into stone. Uh, you know, uh, their whole life, I mean, there was not a single capital of the Mughals themselves migrating from one place to, uh, to the other. Look at the evidence provided to us by the coins. Yeah. Uh, the coins would have legends. Jahape bhi emperor rahega, usko jayega daro sultanat. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> Even Gwao may be Jabu Sikka Dala Jatata, Jahape Mughal camp Otata, Uskobi Daru Sururu Daru Sultanat Palajaga, Uskanam Kerkelik, and there is so much information. Uh, but I would uh, 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 stop there, and that is uh, a different discussion altogether which needs. A full topic, and uh, inshallah, at some point of time, we may have a discussion on that. Uh, Mayank, you mentioned one thing which uh, uh, you know interested me, but also raised a few questions in my mind. You said valor uh, was a response to the challenges of the colonial period, and their valorous stories and legends, type of legends, uh, which we find from Rajasthan, quoted by Todd and others are actually a response uh, to the colonial allegations and whatnot. Right, that is, uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, which is quite plausible and uh, which, uh, uh, I mean, appears to be quite correct. But then, why did not such 
stories of valor develop in other regions why are they confined only to the region of so called rajputana i mean these valorous stories uh, are only confined say the neighborhood gujarat hmm. uh, it, it's a uh, it's a, a sort of a not only a hinterland but the uh, place which is connected with the ports and most of the you know things are coming from there and the type of people who live there the merchants uh, they are also being sub they were one of the first to be subjugated but no valor in stories sir uh, punjab punjab gorkhan so they have their tradition it is the uh, mughal british army the way they were recruiting their army in response to the matlab it's a, the, if you one is interested one can read amar farooqi Yeah. and uh, and then the work on uh, the work of sima alvi on the on the uh, yeah. Yeah. british army it is the british quest for seeking the loyalty which stress a particular characteristic of a particular community so the valorization was to seek legitimacy in the british uh, administration or british army so there is a whole okay. tradition to which they were reinforcing their own lineage of a fighter right okay okay fine uh my second query to you would be uh uh you know uh, i listened very keenly uh, to the first part of your uh, you know lecture uh where you de- dealt with a large number of documents uh i have personally uh, gone through arsattas also you know I, when i was working on the urban uh, middle classes under the mughals uh professor sp gupta was alive uh, his book was there uh, you know his students uh, uh, they were working under him for example one of uh, his students sumbul khala uh, sumbul halim khan ultimately yeah, uh, wrote a book on arsattas another type of documents i think she has one or two uh, books uh, on which she had done her work so during that period of time the, these uh, pe- people being my contemporaries i also started uh, you know when we sit together so you, you look at the other people's documents and things so i started looking at my own uh, you know uh, information whether it is there a uh, large number of arsatta imarti documents were found there uh, i mean arsatta imarti documents give us much information regarding the prices of the building material uh, the wages which are being paid uh, to the uh, laborers and uh, artisans and others working uh, in the building and industry department so on and so forth uh, so a very uh, rich source of information and uh, i think uh, that even if one wants to work on only one type of documents from yeah. rajasthan or satta when can keep on writing a number of theses on that so granted and you did speak about them but my question is that during my brief uh, you know intrusion into this field i found that there are a large number of bilingual documents uh, same document having persian as well as the rajasthani on the same paper so would you like to say something regarding these bilingual documents and uh, when did this bilingualism end as far as rajasthan was concerned i mean we had a lecture by samira sheikh a few weeks back on gujarat and she discussed the bilingual gujarati documents so i became more interested to know, uh, interested to know she she also talked about bilingual epigraphs yeah there uh, are uh, and uh, naturally there are many bilingual uh, you know epigraphs in rajasthan as well uh, uh, any comment on that and when did this bilingualism end if you can have some information uh, i must confess uh, i will not be able to give you a very concrete answer when it end uh, but uh, what is uh, the bilingualism is an important uh, manifestation of overlap of authority and the process of legitimization uh you are the, the uh, if you recall uh, philip wagner's work uh, when he says that i am sultan among hindu kings 
the the whole identification is in terms of the dominant power so on the one hand you are creating documents in your own vernacular language through which you are interacting and then you are making it as a part of the larger tradition which you are copying from the mughal empire the other thing which i can it's, it's a simply guess i am not uh, i cannot say with a very uh, a conclusive argument or evidence that there are parganas who was switching between mughal empire as a as their own territory and the uh, territory of the uh, ruler the, the villages were given in pattas at times they were taken it back from the uh, ruler so this transition of these local areas might have been a reason why they are being written in both the uh, uh, languages the other thing is that perhaps i'm not uh, uh, especially on that perhaps dilbagh singh is a better per person to respond to that the the author who was writing that particular part of that or satta is more conversant with the language of that uh, perhaps in persian or in the uh, vernacular because the evidences which are being collected is basically collated from the other kind of evidences so i'm not very sure why it is being done but definitely the extensive use of persian is very much visible in all these areas uh, not in terms of only the documents Uh, I have been working on another manuscript, uh, Tarikh-e Kilai or Thambor. It's a part of the yeah. Hamir Kav, written in uh, Sanskrit, then Persian, then uh, vernacular, then in Persian, converted back to uh, once again vernacular, then in Urdu. So there is a whole gamut of this communication through various uh, scripts. So there is a large tradition of overlap of scripts or understanding. And uh, as you will, you you are you are the authority on that. uh the most of the uh, literate uh, section of the societies were well conversant with at least three languages so perhaps it was not a barrier for them as it is barrier for us we are not able to work with persian as well as the uh, rajasthani simultaneously uh right i mean in fact uh, i would just add to what you say uh, that even uh, today in uh, jaipur Uh, in certain of the seminars when i had gone there long long back uh, decades ago uh, since around 15 years i have not been to jaipur before that i had gone, been there and i was uh, i mean made to understand that there are certain repositories uh, with books which are written in persian script uh, but are actually uh, uh, the hindavi tongue yes uh, so there are large number of such documents uh, for the uh, for example art kathanak has been found from rajasthan itself yes. i mean one of the very basic important information which gives us so much information about the mughal society uh, uh, so uh, rajasthan believe me um, uh, is much more than what mayank has told I us agree. i agree there is much much more uh, we would be uh, it's almost two hours just 8 minutes to 2 hours uh, but still uh, there are two questions by mirza hasan uh, try to give very brief uh, answer to that uh, uh, the first question is on the tong uh, 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 the history of tong the only rohila state in rajasthan anything which you may be able to tell about that and secondly aziz uh, hasan aziz also asks your opinion about uh, uh, you know uh, works of james scott do answer uh, this question for the first yeah. part i am not competent i can, can simply suggest that uh, the tonk has a very rich archival documents very rich literary uh, the the, the tonk uh, institute has a very rich persian arabic and rajasthani manuscripts available with them so scholars who are working on them can uh, ha have access to the um, uh, extensive documentation i am sorry i cannot comment on that except that reema huja's the larger work of history of rajasthan talks about the history of tonk uh, i'm sorry i can't offer you a specific book on tonk uh, there is one work i have read but i can't recall the uh, the author's name uh, perhaps reema huja's work will give you uh, further bibliography to understand the history of tonk i i think reema huja's work is the best to understand and then from there you can get other uh, uh, references where to look uh, to, to look for hasan aziz i think you should look at reema huja's work yes. uh, as as far as todd is concerned naturally he is uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, 
historians of uh, Rajasthan. Uh, uh, but uh, sorry to say that uh, he also uh, uh, is similar to what Eliot and Dawson tried to do with Indian history, Todd tried to do with the history of Rajasthan. He is someone whom you cannot ignore, but someone who can easily mislead you uh, and make you join the party of Modi. Rudolf and Rudolf have a book on the uh, critically, they have critically examined Toad. So anybody is interested can read Rudolf and Rudolf. It's published by Oxford University Press. I had reviewed that manuscript. It's published. Perhaps Romanticism of Toad was the title of the Rudolf's book. So if you're interested in critically examining Toad, you can read that. Norman Ziegler has critically engaged with that. And we all have been trying to critically engage with the Toad. Uh, well, I think uh, we should end there. Uh, there are a number of questions uh, which are still being asked, uh, which are the languages, uh, court languages. I don't know uh, whether this it differs, it differs from principality to principality, Dunani, Marwadi, Mewadi, Mewati. So there is no one. It is modern understanding of uniform language. So it keeps on changing. But when these principalities are engaging with the Mughal Empire, they are using Persian as a source of communication. So this singular identification of a court language is a problematic, uh, problematic. proposition. Yes, it's yeah. problematic. So, uh, uh, with these, I, think, uh, I mean, Nilanjan also has a number of things to say in Nilanjan Sarkar. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we can uh, uh, deliberate on them uh, later on. Uh, much time has gone by. Uh, I must thank uh, uh, one last time uh, uh, Mayan Kumar for uh, being with us today. Uh, it has been uh, an exhaustive evening, but an evening uh, where at least I learned a lot. Uh, I would just say that uh, 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 Asha Aligar Society and Archaeology as well as Ganga Jamni Heritage uh, would keep on bringing such lectures to you for a few more weeks. Uh, our interest is uh, that uh, the history of our past, especially of the contested medieval period, uh, should be presented to the masses and to our students in a language in which the, uh, they can easily understand. Uh, and that is what we have been doing for the last seven months, uh, twice a week, sometimes discussing uh, the sources themselves. For example, today uh, we look at very exhaustively at the type of source material, uh, both primary and secondary for history of Rajasthan, the Rajasthani sources. Uh, uh, we had a lecture uh, before uh, a few weeks before on the Dutch sources. Yeah, uh, we had uh, lectures uh, on individual source uh, materials. Uh, there are many more on which we can discuss. Uh, we are going to in future uh, uh, one of our programs. We would be dealing uh, with Mughal miniatures also, how they act as a source of history what type of information. Our only attempt at these lectures is that please open your minds and with open minds, read the sources and try to understand our past. That is the only attempt which we are going to make. So I hope that all of you would be joining us for more such interesting lectures in the coming weeks. We will meet you once again on Friday, same time, same place. Goodbye. Good night. Thank you very much. Shukriya Andeem Sahib and Shukriya Asha.